Good morning, everyone. My name is Hope Elizabeth Gillespie, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of CMSMC. Today, we are hosting one of our author chats, which is Landscapes in Materiality with Colton Klein and Tyler Spencer. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. This event is going to be recorded and will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. We ask that everyone keep themselves muted and use the chat function for all questions. I will happily moderate those. And if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in there. I am now going to let Colton and Tyler introduce themselves. Colton, why don't you go ahead and start? Thank you so much, Hope. Um, my name is Colton Klein. I am a recent graduate of the um, master's program in art history at Columbia University. Um, I currently work as a curatorial assistant in pre-war art at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, and I'm also the project manager for the Marston Hartley Catalog Resume. Tyler. Yeah, so I'm, uh, my name is Tyler Spencer. I'm currently an MA student at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. I'll be starting my PhD there in the, uh, in the fall of this year. Uh, my research focuses on the art of the United States, um, primarily 19th, 20th century, but I'm also interested in looking kind of further back bringing in sort of pre-Columbian, Mesoamerican uh, context and sort of expanding the scope of sort of what American art means. Yeah. Awesome. And Colton, if you want to introduce your piece and give a brief synopsis. Sure, yeah. Um, so similar to Tyler, actually, I, I feel like my research um, recently has been focusing on the early 20th century and kind of going back into the 19th century as well um, with a focus on materiality and eco-criticism and affect theory as well. Um, I've also been really interested in thinking about um, kind of local histories of medium and materials um, and uh, thinking about issues of condition and how um, the environment can be a player uh, in kind of what we see in a work of art um, and how often that can challenge artistic intentionality. And so that kind of is a good segue into, into my piece that I wrote um, about um, a Charles Birchfield watercolor from 1920 that um, I was primarily interested in it in the sense that it um, kind of has a dual function of recording um, a site of environmental degradation in southeastern Ohio, um, which in 1920 was actually um, home to the largest pottery industry in the world. And that industry had kind of been devastating um, the agriculture surrounding um, the town in uh, East Liverpool and, and Wellsville, Ohio. And um, so I was interested in Birchfield's depiction of uh, a firing kiln in this watercolor, but also how the watercolor itself and the, and the paper itself has has recorded um, uh, natural degradation and its, and its physical properties. So how um, exposure to light, uh, possible contact with an acidic mat, um, exposure to temperature changes, humidity changes, radiation, pollution, how that has discolored the paper. And so in the upper um, half near the, the top edge, the, the paper is actually discolored. It's quite yellowed and, and toned. Um, and it sort of affects how we read Birchfield's watercolor. So it looks like there's this kind of um, haze or smog that's that's hovering in the sky. Um, and so it very much connects to some of the subject matter that he was depicting, but it was unplanned. And so it's kind of um, a record of how the environment has uh, ha has played a role in the creation of this work of art and, and how we see it now. Um, so my piece was really interested in, in that local history of um, environmental toxicity and, and uh, early industrialization in southeastern Ohio, but also really interested in, in thinking about the object itself and how um, how the environment has played a role in, in what we see um, on the sheet of paper. Yeah, and my 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 piece uh, kind of similarly interested in the question of uh, uh, intention and the influence of environment, sort of via the uh, uh, kind of artist representation of the space, but also in terms of how the natural environment itself sort of impacts itself or imprints itself onto the, in my case, a uh, photograph. Um, so yeah, so my my piece, my article published in uh, December of last year, 
was on the uh, photography of Timothy O'Sullivan, who uh, uh, goes out west in the 1860s after the Civil War uh, and works for U.S. Geological Survey, where they're involved with mapping the land, sort of charting it. Um, uh, and he's hired as the official, as the official photographer. Um, uh, and he kind of, we know his work because they become some of the sort of the, some of the most uh, iconic uh, images of the American West and some of the earliest. Um, so, but my my article is kind of juxtaposing this apparent novelty of O'Sullivan with a kind of what I saw was a large, larger, longer uh, history of uh, engagement, sort of artistic engagement with the American landscape and with a dialogue, a dialogue between American uh, scientists and artists throughout the 19th century, which kind of, in, in my view, kind of builds up and kind of sort of produces um, O'Sullivan's sort of uh, photography. Um, so yeah, but in, in in terms of in terms of O'Sullivan's images in particular, I think what I was trying to really make the case for in the article um, uh, was this affinity between this emerging environmental consciousness in the United States and photography as a sort of practice or a um, a kind of medium of time, a, a sort of medium that works through time, captures time. Um, and I think O'Sullivan's images, uh, in a, in one way, in an intentional way, you can see their interest in the in time in the sense that they're vertically oriented. The composition is often vertical. Um, uh, to, um, they were called fragmented at the time because they weren't horizontal. They didn't often allow the viewer a sense of where they would stand in the picture, right? Uh, so if with the with the vertical framing, it allows the viewer to actually read the strata of the earth. So this is the geological interest, uh, the kind of time of the earth, which is not the time of sort of human dwelling in the landscape. And the other aspect, more, um, more I guess, theoretical, more complicated, um, was thinking of um, sort of how a Sullivan's photography could can be seen as a processual kind of art uh, in the sense that he sort of organizes or sets up um, an, oper a, an operation by which um, the photograph is made sort of by the environment itself, right? So he sets up this um, uh, sort of chemical and durational event, uh, which the natural environment is imprinted uh, physically, but also in terms of the image onto the plate. Uh, so that sort of aspect where there's this interaction between uh, the natural environment itself acting on the work, uh, not only a Sullivan representation of it, of the landscape, but how the, actually the physical landscape itself and its environment is materially captured by the image. Yeah. Awesome. And there, there are two themes that I really think run through both pieces. And actually, while I introduce this first question, I'm going to juxtapose the two images because I think it gives a really great uh, visual for what we're looking with, looking at here. Um, but that's not what I wanted to do. Um, my, my first question as I figure out how Zoom works after three years of using it is going to be, you know, how are both of these pieces products of their time? Um, I think the two themes that really run through both pieces are timeliness and eco-criticism. And I want to start with timeliness because I think it informs the eco-criticism. Um, so whoever would like to start first with timeliness, you can go right ahead. There we go. Oh, great. Yeah, um, I'm happy to go first. I think 
for Birchfield, um, I can give you a brief background on him at this moment in his career. Um, he's born in the early 1890s, um, grows up in Salem, Ohio, kind of outside of the uh, the the art world in New York that's happening at the moment. But he's really engaging with um, some some ideas and themes that many of the modern artists in New York are engaging with, whether that's Georgia O'Keeffe or Arthur Dove or um, some other artists, Marson Hartley, even artists who are really using a modernist kind of sensibility to engage with the landscape. Um, but he's he's really drawn to um, particular landscapes that that resonate with him in Ohio. And so he's very observant of changes that are happening around him. And so I think to your point about timeliness, um, for uh, a PhD student at the University of Chicago, James Harold Hans, I think his name yeah. is, he, he wrote a dissertation on um, on this specific site in East Liverpool and Wellsville, uh, the Wellsville Quadrangle. And, and really um, in his piece, he's, he's also noticing this change um, uh, in which this kiln-based pottery industry is really having a, a, a quite dramatic and devastating effect on, on the environment. And so um, the fact, and this was a geology student who, who's noticing this and, and spending a lot of time um, not only studying the land, the physical landscape, but also observing changes to that landscape um, through industry and, and uh, society. And so the fact that um, that Birchfield is also thinking about these things and also kind of recording them in, in his diaries, which I cite in my article, um, he, he had initially inspired to be a, a nature writer. And so he had been thinking about um, some of these ideas, concepts for quite a long time. And he's I think he, a young man when he when he makes this watercolor in his mid twenties. Um, but he's for for his whole life, he's sort of been interested in, in uh, negotiations between um, the human and non-human sphere, and and really paying attention to these to these, um, yeah, the, these sites of change in Ohio. And I think the fact that he very subtly includes this firing kiln in the center. If you see it right above that sort of low slung building um, at lower center, there's a firing kiln behind a fence right there. Um, and so he's not really giving you like the full industry of, of what's happening in this town, but he's sort of alluding to this um, and, and sort of incorporating it into the landscape in a really interesting way. Um, but uh, his, his journals really make clear what his intentions were here. And also, as I mentioned in my piece, kind of the, the, um, inscription on the back, which is, which locates this in East Liverpool and Wellsville, Ohio, the, the title itself, Hillside Homes does not do that, but the inscription on the back helps us to, to make that um, kind of geospatial connection and that reading. Um, but I think it's, to me, it, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing that Birchfield was aware of these, uh, these changes. I mean, it was two hours south of his home in, in Salem. Um, and the fact that he's kind of making these uh, uh, observations in his watercolors and in his journals at the same time that uh, other commentators are also observing these changes and, and writing about them and expressing concern over them. Um, to me, I think it, 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 uh, it helps to suggest the need for uh, taking a second look at Birchfield, who, as I talk about in my article, has kind of been marginalized in art history because he's quite hard to, to kind of pin down stylistically. And so he changes his style throughout his career. And um, he's been associated with, I think, upwards of a dozen movements in the early 20th century, whether it's the American scene or regionalism, modernism, um, Bovism even. So he's really uh, an artist that because of his inability to be kind of categorized and, and pinned down within the the canon that's been developed has kind of slipped off the page in some ways and I think that reframing him um, as an artist very much concerned with his, the local landscape and with ecology and with toxicity um, and I think the journals bear that out I think that's an, a, a really important way to reframe our thinking of Birchfield um, and so that was one thing that I was trying to do in my article and kind of express the timeliness for thinking about him uh, in this way. And uh, specifically this one work, which um, kind of exists at the margins of different styles in his career. And so again, challenging that idea of this uh, art historical desire to um, 
to kind of compartmentalize and classify and how works like this that kind of exists between styles. Um, his early style kind of ends in 1920. The next style begins according to, to many um, scholars in, in the early 1920s. So 1920 itself is kind of this borderline. Um, and I think it, it nicely relates to how people think about Birchfield more wholly as an artist who um, kind of exists at the margins and the peripheries of early 20th century American art history. Um, and so I think in choosing this work, I wanted to to highlight that, but also to to show how um, this work could really serve as this this marginal work that's never been written about could really serve as uh, a springboard for kind of reimagining Birchfield or, or um, reinvestigating him and uh, thinking about him as an early eco artist. And I think um, it's interesting that Tyler's uh, the question of, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but of artistic intentionality and whether the artist was aware of some of these kind of eco-critical um, conversations they might be having. I think for Birchfield, he was such a prolific writer. Um, he kept journals throughout his entire life, I think over 72 volumes, something like that. Um, and so he did write about this scene and he did write about these changes, uh, industry, um, toxicity, things like that. So um, yeah, I think it's it's uh, a moment in time where I think it is important to um, reevaluate some of these artists who are engaging with concerns that are very much uh, still with us today and, and, and just as important to us today, if not more so. So um, that was one reason that I chose this work and, and specifically Birchfield as well. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. It, it makes me, hearing your answer makes me kind of uh, wish O'Sullivan had had diaries or kept diaries because it's actually very interesting. O'Sullivan, there's very little written record. Um, and most of the remaining records just kind of uh, sort of uh, notes, kind of business. There's nothing like any sort of uh, uh, systematic reflection or even a cursory re re remarks on photography or what he's doing, you know, or his position within art or within photography culture at the time. Um, and so th with this image, so that is to say, it's it's question of intention is difficult with O'Sullivan because it's it's kind of all up to the interpreter to uh, pinpoint what that intention is, right? Um, and with this, so with this image, for instance, um, which is taken in Canyon de Chez, um, uh, we don't know whether O'Sullivan um, knew previous survey reports. Uh, and there were previous survey reports where um, they go through the American uh, survey um, expeditions went through the same area. And they even had a, had a, had, a, had an artist who um, made images of the same site. I think something like 10 years earlier, 10 or 15 years earlier. So we, we don't know if uh, Sullivan knew of this, but it makes for an interesting connection if he did, or it's interesting either way, I guess. But, um, uh, and there's, there's another point where, uh, I mean, I think this image in particular, it's a very striking image. Uh, it's sort of enig enigmatic uh, in terms of its visual kind of composition, but also it, given the time period, given what's going on, it's it's in the middle of kind of Western expansion, manifest destiny. And there's some kind of, I mean, it's easy for us now, I guess, to read into it, this sort of comment on a kind of progress of civilization discourse, right? Because he's, this is a, this is a this is a photographer using the the most at that time, sort of advanced technology to take a picture of this you know primitive civilization. Uh, so whether O'Sullivan himself is thinking in this in these terms, or if he kind of notes the irony, almost, uh, is kind of up for debate, right? Um, and yeah, and also with with this image and. Um, when the when the previous survey came through this area, they actually found uh, uh, indigenous uh, community uh, living in these dwellings, and they kind of cleared them out. 
So that knowing that historical fact gives the image another sort of uh, uh, significance, which again, you don't know whether O'Sullivan intended it or not, but it's interesting how it, it works that way if you have the uh, sort of historical frame. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, the, the question of intention there, um, again, like I think if, if you had a Sullivan's diaries, it would be quite a compelling uh, a sort of uh, case history if, if you could know what he was thinking. Um, but the, the other aspect of this image I would draw out is uh, I think uh, in order to understand these images, you, you have to see that uh, uh, it takes a very long time for him to set up this shot, to select the view, the angle, where is he going to frame it? How's he going to frame it? In what light? What's the time of day? All these factors are going into this one image, which I think a lot of times in photography, um, photography theory, we sort of assume everything's a snapshot. Um, you know, there's this concept of um, decisive moment, right? Here it's an undecisive moment, right? It takes a, a very long time. There's a lot of calculation going into it. Uh, but again, at the same time, we don't know exactly uh, what precisely O'Sullivan is thinking. So it becomes a sort of, I mean, kind of the point, the point of the article and the point of my research was to sort of tease out this um, intention in a way, which we can't know. But you, you can you can try to probe the image in order to uh, sort of figure it out. Yeah. Tyler also really was drawn to your observation that photography and, and kind of geology are, are linked in that durational uh, capacity and the fact that the time that would go into making the photograph of the light kind of recording itself on the, on the plate um, and the kind of a similar allusion to um, how long uh, the subject matter that we're seeing here, um, how long that process would have taken and kind of, again, the impact of the environment, the earth on what we see and connecting that to photography and um, the light from the sun, uh, and this scene affecting what we get in the final image. I feel like that connection is really interesting and it, it, it links, I know you, you cited Robin Kelsey, but I think um, it's, yeah, that kind of like self-referential quality of O'Sullivan's work is, is right. really fascinating. And I think you allude to that as well with him kind of sometimes putting in um, someone from the survey there as well to, to um, yeah, to, to make reference to this process of going there and, and right. uh, setting up and uh, that all the time involved in that as well. Right, right. So there's a, so here, I think here, there's nothing, I don't think there's any indication of the survey in this image. No. Right. It's just, it's just an image of this dwelling, uh, which itself, now that you mentioned that, um, the, the dwelling itself is, I mean, carved into the landscape, right? So that's another aspect of this environmental level. Uh, the actual architecture itself is uh, sort of environmentally embedded. Okay. Um, uh, but yes. Um, yeah, I mean, going into, and just to, to continue that line of thought, I mean, thinking about the time that would have that it would have taken to carve these structures out of the rock oh, yeah. face. Um, yeah, I just feel like there's so many allusions to to time and to um, these durational changes in in the work that really kind of again self, are self referential to the process yes. of. Time. Yes, and and the rock is, you you see the, the 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 rock that it was taken out of in the back, right, or all around it. Like it's it's the same stone. Yeah. So it's this other level of uh, kind of reflexive uh, yeah. um, moment. But uh, you, you mentioned the the presence of the survey in the photographs and uh, in, other, in other images, you do have um, survey members in his photographs of natural scenery. Uh, and there are maybe one of the reasons he does this, maybe the most uh, uh, obvious one is that uh, putting a figure in the landscape gives a sense of scale, right? Um, 
which is very important for photography and especially for uh, kind of scientifically oriented photography, right? In terms of mapping, in terms of uh, charting the landscape, it helps to have this sort of measure. Um, um, and then also there's there's a there's an aspect where, uh, again, this is a reflexive moment where he seems to be interested in documenting the documentation. You know what I mean? Uh, and in other images, when it's not only survey members in the in the in the image, but he includes kind of camera equipment, sometimes multiple cameras, in his image. So again, it's it's the question of, uh, I mean, he must have been sort of aware of this sort of reflexive aspect. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be a very early moment of that, right? Um, so I, yeah, it's it, it's another aspect where it's just an it's a kind of enigmatic uh, presence uh, in in his images. Yeah, and in some ways, it's 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 unfortunate that we don't have his writings, but in in other ways, it sort of opens up our interpretation to imagine uh, all these possibilities in a way that I think um, is is kind of like. Uh, yeah, where where if there if he had some sort of like specific stance on this, it would be somewhat limiting in a way. But the fact that we don't have the text, it kind of opens up these images to so many different um, exciting interpretations and yeah. possibilities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So something that that really strikes me, and I think it was the first thing that caught me when I read both of your pieces. Um, and this is the archaeologist in me, so I apologize, is something that you guys have mentioned, which is the layers. And I think that having the two pieces up on the screen really shows you can draw the lines in each, like the, the horizontal and the vertical grids, like in each piece. And it's, it's really fascinating to me that in the two different mediums, they are gridded, for lack of a better word, so well. Um, and but they're also unfinished in a very artistic and also scientific way. And I think that something really interesting for the two of you to kind of get into is how there is both a an intentional artistic component to them, but there's also a very scientific component to both of them. Um, Colton, you mentioned the unintentional effects on the Hillside Homes piece. So if we could start with that, and then kind of go into the survey aspect, which we've talked about a little bit already, and how those two really have a great conversation with one another because they're not necessarily intentional, but they are arguably the most important byproduct of what we're seeing, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good observation. I mean, I think that's one thing that I wanted to make clear, and it's quite obvious that Birchfield did not intend for this kind of scientific process to to happen in the sky where this toning has changed what we see. Um, but I think as I, as I sort of allude to, it's um, kind of granting a sense of agency back to the environment that I think virtual was very much concerned about. Um, and yeah, it, the, the gridding of the piece too, I hadn't thought too much about that, but it really is this layered um, kind of upward movement in a way that is it, when you have these two images next to each other, they're so visually um, similar in that sense, but the, kind of the, the drive of your eye upward into the composition. But I think the longer you look at the Birchfield, you kind of see these different striations of, you have the railroad in the foreground, then you have these stairs that kind of lead up a hill where the hill kind of slopes, and then there's a road with telephone poles. Um, and then that hill again slopes up, you have some houses, and then you get to this very barren um, hillside where uh, the trees appear to have no branches, they're, they're sort of stumps. Uh, there are, um, even in the upper left, there's this sort of menacing looking tree that is is almost deformed in a way. And so I think he's he's really showing you how, um, or, or uh, you could read into it, how this uh, human incursion onto the landscape, uh, starting in the beginning here with the railroad and, and moving up has kind of led to this moment at the top of the scene where um, there's no vegetation, the, the trees are, are, are dead or dying. Um, and I think the, the unplanned formal, uh, 
quality of the of the the haze in the sky created by this oxidation or um, contact with an acidic mat or I mean there are many different possibilities for how how that happened but nevertheless it did happen and it sort of changed the way that we view this I mean the sky was initially you can see hints of it uh, a sort of light blue color that's poking out from the clouds but now that it's changed and it's this uh I think it even relates to Birchfield's description of like a heavy pall of of uh, uh, kind of rust flavored air in, in the sky. And I think it's interesting to think about the fact that this happened naturally um, and that it wasn't, it's sort of the environment again, becoming an agent in this, in this work. And I think that um, we have to make it clear that Birchfield didn't plan for that, but the fact that it did happen and that it's now a part of the work we need to, at least in my view, we need to consider it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I hope I'm just looking at these two images next to each other. It's it's such a great visual comparison. And I think that um, a really smart connection that you, that you and Mary Kate have made here. And Tyler, I think that something that you mentioned actually feeds into that really well, which is the O'Sullivan photography is a very subtle reminder of manifest destiny, right? It's something that we're, we're thinking about as we're doing, as, as he's doing these surveys, right? So you mentioned earlier that in the previous photographs of the canyon, um, there were inhabitants and now there there aren't anymore, right? So what what I'm what I'm discovering while you guys are talking, because you guys are brilliant when you're discussing these two pieces, it's incredible, um, is that they're they're both really they're both really products of American exceptionalism and manifest destiny in the landscape and how they take pieces of the landscape and make them into what they want them to be, right? Um, when you're talking about the survey, the whole point of the survey is to make things knowable, right? And so I think that they're two very different parts of the United States. They're two very different landscapes, but they're becoming similar in the way that they're being changed naturally in order to become American. Um, yeah, I think that that's a really great point. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think you, you, you have to read the photographs in terms of this background of massive western expansion but also industrial expansion right i mean uh, most of the surveys are following along although they they never really show this most of the images are taken not very far from uh rail railroad lines that are already going up um so there's there's almost a kind of manufactured uh i don't know firstness about it if that's if that's a term that makes sense um uh, almost as if they discovered it, but in fact, uh, it's actually, it's normally rather near pre-existing uh, railroads. And in the case of this image, of course, it's already been explored multiple times. Uh, and it's even been uh, uh, pictured before. Um, but yes, in, in terms of looking at these two images, it is interesting that I hadn't noticed it before, but it, it almost has a similar structure with the, with the, uh, uh, sort of dwellings as it goes up the hill, right? Uh, which has this interesting, and it, it's it really is quite similar. Uh, uh, the juxtaposition between uh, natural sort of environment and cultural uh, uh, sort of buildings, like architecture, uh, and maybe in both cases, there's a sense of somehow the natural environment will. Uh, turn against or somehow overtake uh, the human. And I think that's an interesting aspect in O'Sullivan's photographs, which I think it's different from a lot of other survey photographers, where you could see a sort of counter manifest destiny uh, reading, right? Uh, uh, but And even in this image, I mean, is it necessarily a triumphal announcement of, you know, uh, progress of American civilization? Uh, it's it's more of a, I think it's kind of, I don't know, it's questioning. It's maybe, maybe even foreboding, you know? And I think that's true with a lot of his images. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that connects to the Birchfield as well. I think the point of... Um, the the landscape the landscape in in juxtaposition with the architecture i mean i think his representation of the architecture is 
is kind of not uh it, it's not as aligned with landscape as O'Sullivan's uh depiction of of uh, these dwellings carved into the hillside I mean I would I would argue that his representation of the dwellings on the right here are are hypercritical in a way and that they're, they're they have this kind of gothic quality to them and and uh a foreboding kind of quality to them and some of the buildings that he's shown I mean it's you kind of question what they what purpose they would even serve I mean those three buildings at the left that have kind of a window whether they're outhouses or or what they might you know it's unclear what they might be but there are many structures in this composition where the purpose of the building is is unclear and they've kind of disrupted the landscape um and again you see that in uh even at the top there's there's this very strange um two-story building with like one window on top of it, another yeah at the center and it's 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 kind of unclear what what many of these structures what purpose they would serve um and i think again that connects to uh kind of birchfield's criticism of this incursion on on the landscape i don't think he's i don't think he's showing these uh buildings in a way to highlight kind of progress or any any sort of positive uh feeling towards what's happening to the landscape i mean to me it, it comes across as uh as kind of absurd that some of these buildings seem to have no clear function to have no purpose but they're kind of again um now occupying the landscape and kind of decimating the landscape in some ways i mean it's like the hillside has been cleared in many places and um yeah it, it seems like this this to me a very a very stark juxtaposition between um human activity versus the landscape um you know, trying to to survive in this in this in this site, and I think again that connects to the landscape ultimately playing this role in in what we see with it with the sky, where the environment does have agency actually. And I I think in the in Birchfield as well, there's, um, uh, it's it's it is this as as uh, Hope mentioned, there is this kind of scientific aspect. It's a very rational aspect to it. It's gridded. It's yeah. kind of on these planes but at the same time the structures themselves are kind of irrational or they don't really make sense right so there's this kind of uh, uh rational vision that's animating it but at the same time it falls apart mm -hmm. right totally and i think that that perfectly kind of ties in to tyler what you said about progress so like what is and I apologize for the jumble of words that are about to come out of my mouth, but I'm very excited. Um, what does progress look like when we as humans kind of change a landscape from how it has kind of naturally created and how does nature consider progress and how do we consider progress, right? Um, something that you guys touched on that I didn't even think about um, is you can very clearly in the Birchfield see the railroad tracks. Um, but in the O'Sullivan, we know they're there. We know that there's a huge expansion of the railroad into the, into the, the, the West at this time. Um, and it's very unspoken in there too. Like the, the progress is very unspoken in the O'Sullivan. And I think that when you look at the two of them together, they almost, they're a before and an after, right? Um, and I think that there's something to be said about how you can tie the industrialism into the kind of unspoken, the unspoken, and again, we talk about intent a lot, the unspoken intent in O'Sullivan, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, uh, and I think, yeah, and it, I think you can read it in um, multiple ways. Uh, I think it, it, there there is a sense in which is some kind of warning or, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what you think, but I mean, I don't think this can, this isn't a sort of triumph, triumphal portrait. I don't think, I think it's a very uh, mysterious, even dark sort of portrayal. Uh, and, I mean, there's a sense, I mean, the irony of it, of course, is that at the same time that the railroad is going up, uh, Western uh, settlement is happening, expansion, industry is happening. At the same time, there's this image of a decayed civilization, right? Uh, 
a civilization, a civilization that's over. So is it the is it that there is the idea is that there is a new one coming, or is that this one is going to be the same? Uh, you know, at at some point in time. Yeah, I think Tyler, that connects with so much of your argument, kind of connecting back to these earlier nineteenth century thoughts about cycles and about how so many landscape painters in the early 19th century were alluding to the sense of kind of like destruction and rebirth and the violence of um, uh, Earth's natural processes kind of then being uh, turning into this sort of Garden of Eden, Eden where the vegetation covers up these processes and then it goes back again. And so this idea of, um, yeah, the, the cycles and and kind of the, um, in, in some ways, sort of the way that Earth time or the Earth is is ultimately kind of um, is uh, yeah we'll we'll sort of triumph over any sort of human development which will at some point kind of return to the Earth and then and then come back at least you know some of the the um, Thomas Cole paintings that you mentioned and uh, Frederick Church paintings that you mentioned kind of allude to that 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 sense of a cycle. Yeah, I think that's right, and the the. There's a qu the question of the manifest destiny is uh, is kind of can human power industry the machine is it enough to break this cycle right that's kind of the question that's what's at stake um, and I don't know I think in in O'Sullivan it's a maybe maybe not yeah. sort of feeling yeah. Yeah, in archaeology, we very much have a rule that if you have one civilization, you have another one underneath it and another one underneath it and another one underneath it. And I think that that kind of rings true in this, too. You can you can almost see what's underneath hillside homes. Right. You can almost kind of understand that that was once something. And it's very clear in O'Sullivan, like this is the immediate aftermath of this being something. Right. Um, and I think that those two things really play beautifully into a concept that we deal a lot with in archaeology and ancient history which is you know kind of reclaiming things to to inform a national identity or or a cultural identity um and actually that's that's my next question um culturally i think these two images speak to the same the same kind of thing um and they're just done, it's done between two different types of mediums. And this kind of gets to Sydney's question here. Um, the two mediums are, you know, they, they seem like they're a snapshot in time, but they are very highly composed and intentional. And I believe Sydney's question was along the lines of how long would it take Birchfield to create these images? And then Tyler, you were talking about it taking time to set up the shot. How much time does it take to do that? And and when you're doing a survey, obviously you're pre-planning certain things. So what aspects of that would have been planned? Uh, Colton, if you want to start first with the the composition of Birchfield. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think um, watercolor obviously is a very quick medium. It dries fast and it's uh, as soon as you put kind of the pigment down, it's soaked into the paper and, and you can't, you can paint over it, but you can't change it as you could with an oil painting. Um, and so for Birchfield, I mean, his process was really interesting at this time. He would, uh, he was working a full-time job, I think as, a, as an accountant, um, and would make sketches on his lunch break every day uh, and then come home at night and and uh, make a watercolor. And so he did that for, I guess, five years maybe while, while he was living in, in, in Salem and doing that. Um, so he was, he was really working constantly. Um and I mean, for a trip like this, where he's taking the the rail car, you know, to a different town, I mean, possibly that would have been on a weekend or, or uh, when he's investing more time in this travel. But um, the process of actually making this watercolor would have been quite fast. And he he worked very, very quickly. Um, and so I think that it's a really interesting observation to think about how fast he produced this versus how slow and how durational the, the change in the paper would have happened in the, in the sky. Um, and so there's this image that's created quite quickly versus um, the really uh, kind of the the haze in the sky would have developed over decades um, that wouldn't have happened immediately. So there's this interesting um, uh, durational kind of uh, opposition here between the image that's been produced probably in an afternoon very quickly versus uh, 
the haze that's kind of invading the composition that would have happened over decades. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think, again, that points to this kind of question of uh, the duration of time. And um, I think it is uh, interesting to, to, to note how um, that there is this, this huge difference in, in terms of virtual would have produced this quickly versus uh, the environment uh, over time, very slowly creeping into the composition and uh, playing its own role. Yeah. And I think you can, I think that relates back to the, the, sort of architecture itself or the, the construction of the houses would have been uh very quick right so it's the, the it's the opposite of this natural process and this uh, you know the rising of the hill in the background and upon which the uh, buildings are uh, laid out uh so that's yeah. that's yeah and even even thinking about the fact that um the industry itself i mean in 1920 it was reported that this town in southeastern Ohio had the largest pottery industry in the world. Um, and so for that to, I mean, I wouldn't think that most people would think of, you know, East Liverpool, Ohio as this massive capital industry, but at, at a time it, it sort of was. And so how quickly things can change like that and how, um, you know, these houses would have been constructed quite, as you mentioned, Tyler, um, uh, hastily, uh, to support this industry and how quickly that industry can can vanish and change. And so, yeah, comparing that time to the geology uh, of the landscape itself is uh, another, connects with the idea of the haze versus the, the quick execution of the watercolor. Yeah, there's, and then I, with you saying these things, I'm, I'm thinking of another image of a Sullivan's where he has a, uh, he puts a glass bottle next to a rock, a kind of big rock in Arizona. Um, and it's a kind of weird image. It's it's because it has a sort of studio feel, like it's still life sort of, it's set up. He's obviously it's composed. He's put the bottle in a certain place. Um, but you see there this kind of contrast between, and I should say the, the rock face is this kind of interesting has this interesting texture it's been sculpted by you know the sands and wind and time over so many years and beside it you have this bottle industrial produced glass bottle very sleek to modern design right and he puts these two together as if he's making some kind of comment on it's kind of two two sorts of sculpting sculpting by time the natural environment and then the sort of industrial induced uh you know rapid uh sculpting um so that made me think of that but in in terms of um hope's point about the time it takes to uh sort of produce the image um i think it's not only a question about the time it takes to produce the image but also like the manual labor the physical the physical sort of uh hardships uh, maybe not so much in this image because it's kind of a flat ground looking up, but in, uh, in other images where he has to decide, you know, like he has to climb. Tyler, you, you cut out. We can't hear you. Very, very, very quietly. Hello? Yes, there you go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, I, I was saying, um, um, uh, the time it takes for a Sullivan to, to, uh, to make the photos, um, uh, it all has to do with also his, pos his kind of bodily position in the environment, right? So he's, he's interacting with the environment in a bodily way. He's carrying along all this equipment. And the chemicals that are required to produce the plate in the field, um, uh, and he's also at the same time, it's it, he's he's sort of involved in the uh, he's tracking the position of the sun. He's tracking the time of day. Maybe he visits the site the day before and and the light's not right. He has to come back when he wants the light to be a certain way, uh, or he's sitting in a landscape trying to decide when the best time would be to take the picture. Uh, so all these factors where it's not only what he chooses to 
picture or kind of put in the frame, but also he's trying to control all the natural uh, sort of forces outside the frame and how they are, uh, how, how they will affect what's in it, right? So that, that was one of the main things in my article. I tried to kind of tease out this, looking at the photograph, not only as a sort of what's there, but also what would have to be there for it to appear. Yeah, there almost has to be a catalyst. Like the, you have to have the perfect set of events in order to get all of that the right way at the right time and then to have this specific photograph. Um, and that's the amazing thing about photography, right? Is that you can capture the same thing and it's going to look a million different ways. Um, you brought up an interesting point about the physical toll of photography. And I mean, there is 100% a physical toll represented in hillside homes. Um, being from the general area where hillside homes is depicting, there is a lot of physical toll from the industrialization. Um, and I think that that's a very interesting juxtaposition between the types of kind of manual and, and physical labor that are involved in the two things that are depicted here. So kind of as a final thought, because that was the most surprising thing to me about the two of these um, images, which this has been an incredible conversation. I'm so glad that we did this today. Um, but my my final question, it's, it's a fun one, is what did you find that surprised you when you were studying these? And Colton, I'll throw it to you first. What was the most surprising thing that you kind of discovered in your investigation of the image? Oh, it's a big question. I mean, I think having uh, seen this work in person and inspected the Verso, I mean, that was sort of the catalyst for making this argument. As I said, the title itself gives no indication of where this is, it's just Tulsite Homes. Um, but the fact that Birchfield recorded on the Verso, um, kind of that specific spatial information that that uh, opens up these readings about uh, what's happening in East Liverpool and Wellsville, Ohio in 1920. And then I think, Probably the most surprising part of that research process was being able to locate um, a diary entry that seems to directly connect with this scene. And um, I, I cited in my article, but it actually kind of functions as a workable visual analysis of this site. And I think it also um, gives an indication of, of Birchfield's kind of personal uh, stance and, and his position here where he um, I can read the quote. He he's talking about East Liverpool, and he says that it's a town in the grip of a soulless industrialism that chokes human life with complete callousness. I mean, that's a pretty uh, kind of damning indictment of what's happening uh, to this town. And I think, um, again, I think that that connects to uh, this this um, the importance of of rethinking Birchfield and and not kind of having this long debate about it. Well, is he, is he a regionalist? Is he a, you know, is he a, a modernist? Is he uh, an American scene painter? I mean, to me, those, those questions are sort of unproductive in a lot of ways. And what's more urgent is really thinking about how he's observing um, and commenting on, on these, these, uh, these massive changes to, to his kind of local uh, where he grew up in Ohio and, and seeing these changes and making these observations and recording them in his in his subject matter and then um, in his diaries as well. And I think, yeah, the, I mean, overall, the most surprising uh, part of this research process was really identifying that that journal entry and seeing how it connects. And he wrote that a year later. So, I mean, he had been returning to this site, you know, clearly multiple times um, and uh, thinking about it for for a long time as well. So, um, and it wasn't exactly close to to Salem where he lived. I mean, he would have had to take in, to take a a rail car there. And so he's kind of seeking out this place as as a uh, as something that is clearly concerning him. And I think that becomes clear not only in the in the journal entry, but also I think when you then think about that in connection to the subject matter and and you use that inscription on the back to to connect it to East Liverpool and to what's happening in, in uh, East Liverpool and Wellsville in 1920. I mean, I think it just kind of loads this, this image with, uh, with more information. And um, yeah, again, I think Birchfield's such a 
important kind of early eco artists. And I think this is a, a really um, important example of, of his work and his concern. Yeah, I think what, what surprised me, I mean, I guess the reason why I was looking at a Sullivan's photographs at all was because uh, I was just initially so struck, and I still am actually, uh, they're just very striking images, very mysterious, layered. I, I, that's, I'm, I'm still kind of puzzled by them. Um, but in terms of when I started the research, I, I, I kept being surprised how uh, sort of the survey photography had its fingers in all these aspects of sort of American uh, 19th century, kind of the, the transformations of uh, 19th century that happened in America that totally reorganized American life uh, in the later 19th century. And then of course in the 20th century, science, industry, uh, growth of government, government bureaucracy, all these kind of themes are happening uh, just within this kind of survey. Um, so lo looking at his the archive from this, it's just a fascinating, uh, I mean, you have documentation of railroads, you have documentation of uh, mining industry, which is a very innovative, innovative at the time. Uh, you have documentation of, like in this image, sort of uh, indigenous culture. Uh, so, so many facets of kind of American life and culture at the time were captured by these images. Uh, and in, and kind of to relate these to today, I mean, I was thinking this. I was thinking these of these images also in terms of uh, it's a kind of early case of uh, government sort of investment in the production and collection of of, of images, right? Uh, so there, there's a sort of link between um, kind of the survey photographs and 21st century sort of surveillance questions, right? Uh, production of uh, uh, images of uh, and maps uh, that, that are collected centrally, right? Uh, it, it's, it's a very compelling kind of uh, link there between the two, yeah. And I just thought of another title for this whole event, which could have been juxtapositions in early American life. It would have been great. Huh? Um, guys, thank you so much. This has been absolutely a blast talking to both of you. Um, we do have another event coming up on May 16th, which is how to write a conference proposal. And it's going to be at 6 p.m. As always, with all of your CMSMC questions, please feel free to email us at cmsmc.org. And on behalf of CMSMC, Colton and Tyler, we thank everybody for joining us today. And for those of you watching later, thank you so much.